Hello and welcome to the San Francisco Public Library, um, to this wonderful Lauder Forum Archive lecture tonight. Um, my name is Samantha Cairo Taubi. I am a librarian in Book Arts and Special Collections on the sixth floor. And many of the images you've been looking at are from our collection. So if anything excites you, come on up and see us. We have a couple of different collections that um, would interest people in topography. Um, one of them is the Robert Grabhorn History of Printing and Development of the Book. Lots of different things from the 14th through the 21st century. So amazing topography collections, catalogs, um, paper sample books, books printed by Aldous Minutius to Robert Grabhorn himself from the Grabhorn Press. We also have the um, Richard Harrison collection of ca um, calligraphy and lettering, and we have examples of over 100 artists, um, manuscripts, broad guides, correspondence, sketches, um, including medieval manuscript leaves, and also some Father Kadich inscriptions. We have three of them. One's on display in the rare book room. The other two are just really, really, really heavy. <laughs> But you're welcome to come and take a look at them. We also have um, some of his rubbings from the Trajan's Column, taken from 1971, and books written by him as well. So welcome tonight, and I'm going to hand this over to Grendel, who's going to introduce our speaker. All right. Hello, everybody. Wow. Welcome to Letterform Lectures. It's amazing to be back in the Karat after two years, two plus. So thank you so much to Andrea, to Samantha, and Kenny, and all the librarians and staff who are making us so welcome here. Um, my name is Grendel, and I'm Education Director at Letterform Archive, which is also the home of Type West, our school of type design. And I want to give a massive shout out to Skilla Zaccolini, who's in the second row here. Skilla is the mastermind um, in the background of this lecture series. So um, thank you, Skilla. OK. OK, well, here's my little public service message. Yes, the pandemic is still here. So uh, I am promoting masking. Let's do it and stay safe and healthy. Um, so. Letterform Archive is the home of Type West, School of Type Design. We have a whole bunch of great lectures uh, coming up in 2022, so look at our website for more details. We have an exhibition open right now. It's called Strike Through, and it is um, so awesome. It's a whole uh, bunch of political posters. It's an exhibition of protest graphics that was curated by Stephen Coles and Silas Monroe. And this exhibition will make you want to um, grab a, uh, a stencil or some collage materials and go whip up some hard-hitting posters to take to the streets. And don't worry if you don't think you have those skills. We have your back because we've got a workshop, um, internationally known radical artist, Fabiana Rodriguez is leading a workshop for us in art and social justice graphics that you can sign up for. It's just one day only on September 17th. So you can find that on our website. Um, and then, woohoohoo, this weekend in person with tonight's speaker, Paul Herrera himself, he's going to serve up the Kaddish way to do brush written letter forms with a side of slate letter cutting. So this workshop is happening in just a few days. Tomorrow is the deadline to sign up. So sign up now if you haven't already. Um, all our in-person workshops require appropriate masking and physical distancing, but we also have great ventilation and high-grade air purifiers, so no pesky viruses at the archive. Um, we have a couple other uh, workshops coming up. These are online. We have a crash course in type selection with our very own Stephen Coles and Christopher Sly. Everything you wanted to know about choosing type, but were afraid to ask. This top team of type experts will get you started on the path to great type choices. And they'll give you tips on how to better organize your type library as well. This is for beginners and pros. Also, 
our popular instructor Lin Yun is returning to school us in the art of flourishing, which contrary to popular belief is not a result of happy accidents, but is really well planned out. So in this workshop, you'll learn the uh, basic elements of flourishing and you'll dissect what makes good flourishing pleasing to the eye. And then you'll combine those elements to make your own designs. Okay, our letter form lecture series is continuing. Next time is online on August 9th when the director of the Museum of the American Printing House for the Blind, Mike Hudson, will share with us the beautiful and surprisingly complex history of printing for visually impaired readers. Don't miss this one. So for more information on our upcoming letter form lectures and our salon series and other upcoming workshops and events as they happen, go to letarc.org slash events. Better yet, become a member of Letterform Archive today and stay in the loop and support these events like this one. Okay, finally, you can follow us on Instagram. All right, um, so welcome to Letterform Lectures 2022, our first in-person lecture since March 2020, which is amazing. Um, Letterform Lectures are co-presented by the uh, SFPL and Letterform Archive. So once again, I want to shout out to Andrea Grimes, to Samantha Cairo Toby, and to Kenny Avila for the, all their work in presenting this series with us since 2016. So um, Letterform Archive, by the way, is a nonprofit institution housing over 85,000 works of graphic design history. We are dedicated to the art and the craft of the letter form. And we would also like to thank Adobe for generously sponsoring this uh, lecture series. You can view all letter form lectures online shortly after they happen. Just go to our website, letterformarchive.org. OK, main event. Um, we are honored to welcome master calligrapher and letter cutter Paul Herrera to the Karat today. So Herrera's. Um, Work was done exclusively with uh, Father Edward Kadich. Beginning in 1967, Paul worked as an inscription cutter and a calligraphy seminar artist with Father Kadish until the time of Kadish's death in uh, 1979. At that point, Paul was invited to continue Father Kadish's classes at St. Ambrose University and did so until 1989. Paul has also served as a faculty member of six international calligraphy conventions. During his 40-year career, Paul has conducted numerous lettering seminars for calligraphy organizations throughout the United States and Canada and the United Kingdom. And he continues to do regular commercial inscription work. And he was an instructor at the former Davenport Municipal Art Gallery. And now he works full time in his studio and offers workshops in brush writing and stone inscription like the one coming up this weekend at Letterform Archive. Okay, Paul told us that when he was a mere baby stone cutter at the age of 18, his teacher would sometimes put him to work when he had other projects to attend to. And if Paul got out of hand, which he apparently did on a regular basis, Kadich uh, would burst in and berate him for quote unquote jackhammering the stones. Eventually, Paul learned a more delicate touch, but hey, we all start somewhere. Okay, we're honored to introduce Paul Herrera tonight. Thank you, Paul. So the green light is on. How's my, how's my? Good. I'm wearing a mic so if I screech by stepping in the wrong direction, I can't stand still. You'll notice it. But, so in the conversion of my PowerPoint to our presentation here, the uh, face on the screen changed. So imagine that as Imperial Roman. Okay? <laughs> I know you all have really good imagination, so that's what it was. But now it's this. So my talk tonight is about, uh, again, Imperial Roman. Starts out with the Emperor Trajan, uh, first century Roman emperor. And when I saw this movie, Maximus the Gladiator, he was also known as the Spaniard, and he was adopted 
by the emperor, essentially. But he was a warrior, which Trajan was a warrior. And he, too, was from the Iberian Peninsula, and he was adopted by the emperor Nerva, who was not very popular with the Roman people, so that when he passed on and uh, Trajan became the emperor, everybody said, oh, good, finally. So one thing that Trajan did was he expanded the Roman Empire, took in a lot of territory, you know, just created a nice, big, happy place, until one of the areas got out of hand. So they decided, ah, we're far enough away from Rome. We can cause a little problem, you know, carry some raids into some Roman territory and just be bad behaved. So Trajan had to go up and sort of spank them, went back home, problem solved. A couple years later, lo and behold, they started acting up again. So Trajan took his army, built bridges this time, and when the Romans came in full force, and they began building bridges, you know you're in trouble. You might as well run for your life or just figure you're going to die by the sword. So there's the emperor on horseback, and this is part of the frieze that is carved in the entire column, and you'll see a picture of that here in a minute. But it's one image after another of that whole campaign where he basically conducted an old-fashioned war. You go in and you kill and slaughter everybody, burn their homes, gather up all the valuable stuff, and take it back home. And in Trajan's case, it was back to Rome. So you can see some of the uh, slaughtering and so forth. You see knives being used against spears. And the Roman army was really quite vicious, but they were very organized as well. In fact, they were the first professional army in that they were a paid force. They weren't just a bunch of volunteers. So they actually paid for their services. So when Trajan got back home to Rome, he uh, took a lot of that riches and built a nice little forum, basically uh, kind of comparable to modern-day shopping mall, you know. Benefit to the Roman people, and it was, a, it was a really nice place, and it was a really special place, provided you were a Roman citizen. If you weren't, you were a slave, most likely. So just to kind of give you a little background on what's going on, Trajan also built a monument to himself in the middle of it. And here's a photograph, thanks to our friend Carl, who uh, took this photo recently. And uh, that's the way the Trajan Forum looks now, what's left of it. So at the top, of course, was a statue of Trajan. Modern day, it's St. Peter. But here are some images of the column. On the uh, left-hand side is a uh, drawing by Father Kadich in one of his publications. And in the center, another photo by Carl, a little more of a close-up. And on the far end, the uh, right-hand side, there's an illustration from a volume printed in 1843, I believe it says. Yeah, 45, 45. There, the entire inscription is intact. Now, there's a gash out of the center, which um, was done, I can't remember the date, but it was later added so that, I'm just guessing, you could put a little porch out front. And the caretaker could you know, sit in nice Roman evenings and a little cool breeze and sort of enjoy the, the sights around for him. Here's another in, uh, illustration by Kadich and another drawing uh, that has the full inscription intact. So any reference that I had was basically from Father Kaddish's photograph, which is what this is, of the entire inscription as it exists now. So when Ned Kaddish was in high school at the orphanage, he was orphaned at age um, 12 and was sent to Mooseheart, which is now, they want to be called a, a child city, not an orphanage. And it is more of a child city. Uh, on on the lines of uh, Boys Town in Omaha, that type of thing. But when Ned Kadich was there, it was an orphanage. And so the orphanage basically trained. It was a fraternal organization, the Loyal Order of Moose. His parents both died. And the obligation of the orphanage was to train the children of their members for a career. Uh, Kadich was trained in printing and uh, music and sign painting. So he became a sign painter, a professional sign painter downtown Chicago. He was uh, proud to say that he was a union card-carrying sign painter professional in Chicago in the 1920s. And, of course, he would also add, in those days, Chicago sign painters were the best of the best. Okay? So here he is in his, uh, the 
book, uh, the, gradual, the graduation book, I should say, uh, when uh, he's a senior, he's about to graduate, and he's in the sign painting apprenticeship with the unions downtown. And of course, at that time, one of the famous books that was well known was Edward Johnston's book, Writing and Illuminating and Lettering. In that book, there are pictures of the Roman inscription letters from the Victorian Albert plaster casts in London. So Kaddish, his uh, woodcut letters are on the right-hand side of your screen. He used the references from that book to carve these letters. He would later write to his friend Graham Carey that he was rather embarrassed by these letters because if you take a real close look at the ends of the strokes, the almost non-existent serifs are uh, really blunted. They're just not much more than a flare at the end of the uh, stems and so on. So this was done in 1935 at the University of Iowa in Iowa City. When Kaddish joined the seminary and he was sent to Rome, he studied the actual inscription on the monument himself, and that's where he saw that they actually had quite nice serifs. All, every letter uh, had a, a nice extended serif, unlike the wooden letters that he just made back in Iowa City from about the same year, 1935. So uh, 1936, he's still a, a seminarian. He wasn't ordained until 1938. A priest friend back in Iowa City sent him a brand new copy of Frederick Gowdy's book. Frederick Gowdy, a type designer out of Illinois, wrote a book and called it the letters, the Imperial Roman letters from the Trajan inscription in Rome. Kadich, in his little correction in the title page, said the title of this book should actually be Letters from the Plaster Cast of the Victorian Albert Museum in London, which in his first publication that you'll see in a minute, he proved are in error. And so one of the notes that he did make was, fortunately, Gaudi left these generous blank spaces in his book throughout the book so that he could go ahead and write his corrections in the margins. Now, the two red squares that you see are the actual text of the book. Everything else are Kadich's notes, and that's just the letter B. It goes on through the entire alphabet, okay? Mostly in English, some in Greek, and also some in Latin when he got real carried away, Kadich. So he made several trips back to the monument to make more rubbings. So we don't know how many rubbings there are. Apparently there's one here, and you have one at the Letterform Archive as well. And fortunately, you know, Rob is quite, and you all are quite proud of that, as well you should be, and it's brought out on occasion. Not very many calligraphy classes that you can go to where they'll bring out an actual rubbing of the Trajan column. So here I am as a young lad helping make a crate to send off some more slates to who knows where. But our favorite letter style was the Imperial Roman. And uh, you fellows from Wichita would probably recognize this. It's in one of your buildings. And so the bronze we didn't make. That was done by someone else. But everything else on the slate as uh, the work of Father Cabbage. So here is the, the full uh, size image of the Trajan it is from Father Cabbage's book, Origin of the Seraph, and the cover of it is down in the lower left-hand corner there. His other publication that came out in 1972 is Letters Redrawn, or I'm sorry, Read Pen and Brush Alphabets. And two of those plates are the Imperial Trajan capitals which in those days, 1972 published, okay, those were all hand-drawn by Father Kadich himself and then reproduced in his book. No Roman typefaces in those days. So here you can see a proportion of what a rubbing would be if it's all sprayed out. And so those are the first, those are the, that's the entire inscription. Had to be done three lines at a time. And of course he would record the date and the year that each rubbing was made in the nice little blank space that was provided at the bottom, okay? And the Kaddish's um, full-sized ca full cast is in Chicago, 
last time I saw it, I couldn't help but, you know, have a picture taken in front of it. Sorry. Uh, but that is his cast, and he painted in the letters as they would have been originally painted in the inscription when it was new. But Kadich being the proper scholar, he did not paint in the missing letter parts, okay? Any distortions, any cracks, anything that was chipped or missing, he did not paint that in. Very little known fact. His first test piece, which was just the partial side of the inscription, to see how it would come out, just a kind of a quality check. That is in the St. Ambrose University Library on the third floor. No one knows it's there because until recently, they didn't know what they had. It was in a closet somewhere. So our little nonprofit back in Davenport said, you know, you really ought to put this out on display. There might be some people interested in seeing it. So it's now behind plexiglass. I was able to take a few photographs before they put it behind the plexiglass. And the purpose for painting in only some of the letters is to show that this difference between, well, the difference in legibility between what the Romans rightly did and those inscription cutters who relied just on the shadows to define the letters, okay? Big difference. This is Kaddish's first publication based on the inscription and the rubbings that he made from the inscription. Now, he wrote uh, notes on that back in the mid-1940s, applied to the Guggenheim for funding to go back and do more thorough, and he was rejected. So he thought, well, he's just a young guy, and must be nothing there. In fact, his letter of rejection said that they found nothing that would add to the sum total of human information. So he was rejected, until he ran into a fellow by the name of uh, William Addison Dwiggins. And there just happens to be a biography of him at the letter form archive. Hmm. Dwiggins, who was well respected, said, you know, I think you got something here, kid. I want you to promise me that you're going to publish this someday. So Kaddish learned his lesson, and he uh, got together enough money to buy his own printing press. He wasn't going to rely on another institution. He bought his own printing press. He bought the paper. He bought the ink. In fact, one of the reviews of this book is Kaddish, he wrote out the entire text in an alphabet that he designed, and the review said Kaddish pretty much did everything except mix up the ink, the batch of ink, and make the paper for the book. So, uh, this is called Letters Redrawn from the Trajan Inscription in Rome, not from the Victorian Albert, okay? The reason I'm showing you that is because the backup, what a scholar Kaddish was, how he recorded it from his rubbings, and these are a couple of plates that I'm going to show you in the next couple slides. The plate from his book is reprinted up above there, and the images below are the rubbing from the column. So you can see how these things match up. And this is basically what I use as reference. Not just the rubbing, but also the letters redrawn. The letters redrawn are traced exactly from the rubbings so that each letter is, represents one letter from the, the Trajan inscription from the rubbings. Now, here's an example, and it has red and green arrows. First of all, the red arrows point to the baseline reference of every letter on the inscription. Okay? The little green arrows show a little break. Those indicate where letters join, letters touch, and they don't all touch in the same place or in the same reference. So this is the reference that I used, having worked with Father, having known the Roman, um, rather than just write out Imperial Roman letters the way I thought it would be nice and pretty, you know. I took not only the rubbings that we have, but also his reference, and I compared those to the actual rubbings. So you see the little letter of numbers underneath each letter. The two P's there, one, one, refers to line one, the top line, the first iteration of that letter P. The second one is one, two. Line one, the second iteration of line of the P, which are different, and then so on with the V. Line one, the second time the V occurs. 
So here are uh, another plate from that series. And what I did was I blew up that plate to the size that I wanted, which was 50% of the actual inscription. I blew up that photo reference, and then I took every letter from his publication, and I reduced it 50%. So, and that was the size that I was going to make my inscription. And then I did my paste up, letter by letter. And striking the baseline, and then using, remember those, those little red arrows that had the, the baseline? That's what I use for every letter. Some just kind of bounce a little above and below, and some serifs kind of dip. They don't go straight across. It's not typography. What Kaddish saw when he went to the actual monument, he saw that this inscription was first written by a sign painter, a Roman sign painter, with consummate skill and the knowledge of each letter form in his mind and was able to write it out fluently before coming back and carving. So then all I had to do was transfer that to a piece of slate. <laughs> and I was, uh, St. Ambrose College was where I went to school. It became St. Ambrose University. And so when it became university, they had big pieces of slates out front, two slates, that said St. Ambrose College. So when it changed to uh, university, I was teaching there. And they said, well, we need, we need two slates that say university now. So I said, okay, right, we can do that. The father was gone by that time. So I made a rubbing, and I transferred, and I laid out the word university. And one of the undergrad students came along and said, oh, that's how you do it. What do you mean? Well, you just trace the letters and put them on the slate, and then you just carve. And I said, you know, don't tell anybody. That's how easy it is, OK? That's, that's our secret. All you have to do is lay the letters out and then just carve them. Right. So there, this is the half scale image that I have. And that's me carving it. Notice the, the magnifying glasses. I, I have 73 year old eyes now. So I use the carving glasses. Here's a close up. And there's the V cut. And there's all the dust that I made while carving the letters. Some still painted some being carved randomly here and there, just for entertainment, instead of going from start to finish, you know, bouncing around a bit. And it only took two years, so. <laughs> constantly making rubbings, and you'll see uh, how we make a rubbing here in just a little bit. But constantly making rubbings as the letters progressed and comparing each letter to its representative letter in the publication. So. I'm not just doing random anything. I'm trying to stay as loyal as I can to the actual inscription letters as recorded by Father Kaddish. Okay? And here's how you make a rubbing. Lay a piece of graphite on top of the finished cut letters. Lay a piece of newsprint, rather, and you take a, a stick graphite and you rub the letters. And that's how it's done. Nothing to it. Back again, constantly referring to the photograph and the inscription. <clears throat> More rubbings, each letter. I think I went through a whole roll of newsprint, bit by bit, over and over, constantly checking. But you see the serifs, you see it, the little wavers there and straightening up those lines and so on. And oh, by the way, the, the little marks inside the letter, the striations we call them, the chisel marks, that is particular to the Kaddish school of inscription cutting. Those striations, those chisel marks, you want those because those help reflect the gold. And the chisel mark follows the corner of the chisel, which is at the root of the V. And it must go in a straight line from the root of the V to the edge of the letter. And it has to be perpendicular to the edge of the letter. That's how precise it happens. It has to be. So at this point, I figured you might be getting tired. And when, you know, how, how detailed is this guy going to get? So I'm thinking, are you not entertained? I hope you are. Carrying on, more cutting, more, uh, scribing in the, the uh, serifs just to make sure I get them exactly right. Because the serifs aren't all the same. Remember the little tick marks? making sure that 
A serif intersected the previous letter at just the right spot in just the right proportion. That's why I have to wear the, the goggles. So, finally, it's almost finished cut. And comparing it again to the uh, photo image, back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes people ask, oh, what is that bar, those three bars across there? If you remember, in, in Roman times, we had no Arabic numerals, they were Roman numerals. Piece of cake. All you had to know was Roman, letter, Roman letters. The Roman letters were also numbers. So that indicates the uh, time. And just about when I was ready to go to the guild, it was sitting in the studio, and the sun came out on the nice Iowa day, came in through the door, and gave this shadow. And I thought, where's my phone? I've got to get some photos of this because it's not going to last very long. And so here's the Star Wars version. Okay, But you see the shadow. You can see the striations on the C. You can see the little chisel marks. Okay, Perpendicular to the edge, following around. And so finally, it was gold leaf time. And that looks sloppy because when we go to put the gold leaf on, we make sure that the gold size, which is what the gold leaf sticks to, floods the cut, we call it. So in other words, you make sure you get it inside the entire cut and off onto the surface, and then you just polish away everything that's on the surface, and what you're left with are the gold letters. Okay? Yeah. Gold does that to people. Ooh, ah. Okay? So um, I kind of checked around. I um, contacted the university. St. Ambrose, and I said, well, you know, you've got this uh, partial cast over there, and you've got that on display. Would you be interested in my half-scale Trajan inscription? Wait, so we went first? No, I just, no, no, no. Hold your horses. You didn't ask me? Hold your horses. <laughs> I thought, all I have to do is carry it across town then, you see? But I'll show you. You're a lot smarter than St. Ambrose. You're a lot smarter. Because they said, um... Well, you know, we've got the agenda already set for the meeting, and uh, it, we just can't add this to it. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. We'll have to talk to so and so, and that person's going to have to talk to such and such. And right about then, I hung up the phone. And I said, I better call Rob. <laughs> and to be quite honest, that's why I don't teach at St. Ambrose anymore. Oh. Haven't for a long time. Okay. So I loaded it up in the van. Rob says, well, uh, how are you going to get it out here? I said, I'm going to put it in my van, and I'm going to drive it out. He goes, what? <laughs> I said, well, you know, I suppose I could put it in a crate, but after two years, I've got a good van. I'll see you in about three days. So out we came, and guess who was there? <laughs> there it is. And oh, by the way, you'll notice that the missing letters in the actual inscription have been restored. I found a Father Cadet sketch of those letters that I'm sure he intended to print in his next publication, which never was published by him. But I found those, and then I kind of guesstimated what those letters might be from some of the other letters. And so I had to make them the size of, of all the rest and just pretty much put those into place. Because in the missing portion, there's parts of letters before the, I, did, I didn't point this out, sorry, in the image. There, there are little bits and pieces of letters previous and after that gash. And so I used that and then filled these in. So trades and inscription in San Francisco. That's the result. Two years labor, examining the, the uh, rubbings, examining the photos, working with Father Kaddish. I just had to do it. I just had to do it. So, At this point, I invite any questions you might have.
Yeah. Is there, there's a question back there. Nothing. Ah, okay. And just to let you know, as far as I'm concerned, that my Trajan slate is where it should be Woo! here in San Francisco. Yeah. Your question. Would you discuss uh, Kadich's um, controversial thoughts about uh, serifs going into the printing world being derived from stone cutters? Oh, um, you know, th this business of his rubbings, his letter forms being turned into type, he was never around to see that, really. Uh, that came after he had passed away. He died in 1979. And I think the, the typeface that you're talking about didn't come out until mid-1980s. So he would be flattered that it's being said that his studies were used as the basis for the Trajan typefaces. I think, you know. He's the okay. source. One more question here. Yeah. That, that's not exactly what I was getting at. Okay. Uh, my recollection is that he had a, a view that printers who design type put serifs in their type because they were following stone inscriptions. Ah, OK. Well, yeah, stone inscriptions. Now, my, my English friends and I, uh, differ as far as our preferences, they know I'm steeped in Kaddish. I mean, that's all I ever knew. So that was where I grew up. I grew up in the school of Kaddish. Some of them prefer the flat top A's and M's, okay? And some of the type designs come from that. Um, father, now in the Gaudi book in particular, Gaudi being a type designer and going to the photographs from the V&A, uh, his problem with Gaudi in particular as a type designer, uh, if I could just kind of focus on him. He respected Gaudi, but he thought that by going to the V&A, Gaudi put, like, for instance, on the, the letter A, the, the majuscule letter A, on the right-hand oblique, Gaudi added the interior, interior serif, which doesn't exist on the Trajan. And Gaudi claimed to use that Trajan as those letter designs that he published in his 1936 book. But that's just to be specific about Gaudi, you know. Uh, Kaddish would, uh, in, in his other book, he pointed out that in certain publications, and he named names and Origin of the Seraph. If you, if you buy Origin of the Seraph, if you ever get a chance to purchase it, pretty much everything's laid out there. And he points out some of the theories that, uh, for instance, the mid arm of the E, the Roman E, the type designers have an upturning serif as well as a downturning serif, not Trajan. Makes a nice type design, but you can't say it's Trajan because Trajan does not have the upturning. Uh, I mean, look at any of the E's on this. There are, in the mid arm, there are no upturned serifs that equal to the downturned serif. The downturned serif is from the movement of the brush and getting a nice clean edge. The brush, Knifing in, we call it, to get a nice square, clean end, and then knifing out of the bottom. Common Chicago sign painter way of writing fast and formal, and then it was just cut. Another argument to kind of continue on with a, a little bit of the differences between Kadich and other people, um, some inscription cutters claim that, oh, there was a division of labor in Rome. The one who wrote the inscription would never have sullied their hands by carving it, you see, that, that's dirty work. Well, whether it was the same person or not, both people had to have the exact image of that letter in their mind. Now, in our school, Kaddish would do the layout, or if I did it, he would come along and correct the letters, and then I would cut them, or he would cut them. We took turns finishing up the slates. So, theoretically, you weren't supposed to be able to tell the difference between his cutting and my cutting, Two different people, okay? But I was not allowed to finish cut a letter until I had that proper image of the Roman letter in my mind. Is, is that helpful? Okay, all right, yes. Okay, here's another question. Okay. 
Paul, I want to say thank you for all this work. Uh, from a preservation point of view, it's quite incredible, especially with how delicate these kinds of objects are. Um, I have two questions, and I have a thousand more, but I'll save it. Save Fire them. away. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you had the chance to be go to the column? I saw Carl Roars had a, yeah. I don't know who he bribed to get in there. <laughs> um, is there a process to do that? And two, um, there's a lot of amazing work that you know you have to be here in this around this area to visit and see. Do you have any plans to publish or um, further uh, disseminate this kind of uh, knowledge the, about the Trajan column? So uh, when I was in the process of doing this, the photographs, some of the photographs that you saw were taken by a colleague of mine, Amy Nielsen. And uh, she was, she's a very excitable person. She's very, yeah, very knowledgeable. She, she has since taken up inscription cutting, and she's like top notch as well, you know. But um, so kind of at her prompting, and when I thought about it, well, yeah, this is a good idea to just kind of put something together. So I did put a, a little book together that you have a copy of at the Letter Farm Archive, and. I can make more copies of that. It's just something I download and then they print it up and so forth. Yeah. So, if you go to Grendel and say, "Hey, you know, I'd like a copy of this," it's possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just a, basically a photo book with some explanation, a little background, and a translation of the inscription as well in there. You know. Yeah, I have to say it's super nice, and it's really nice that we have that uh, on hand along with the inscription, so people can kind of compare and see the process. Yeah. yeah. Question over here. Hi, so I'm, I'm kind of new to this whole inscription, although I've heard of it, of course, but I'm wondering, since you mentioned that there were variations in some of the letters, I'm wondering if you, in your opinion, are they just mistakes from actually, you know, the act of doing it back then with the tools? Are they variations based on just what was available in the surface available, the imperfections of the stone? I mean, I'm just wondering, like, when you mentioned that there were Variations, what kind of variations were they? They are so subtle, you don't even notice them at first. Yeah, just, um, now, as I said, I, I, on the fifth line down, adeclarondum, okay, the R and A do not join, where they could very well join. The, the serif on the oblique of the R dips just slightly below the, the serif on the A. Okay, whereas in other places, the R and the I, like on the fourth line, uh, about uh, oh, almost halfway through, maximo trib, trib, T R I, the R and the I serifs join, but very, very slightly, you know, and that's what I meant by the variations in the letter. Um, now, my English inscription cutter friend pointed out that. On the N's, the letter N, as in my, my band instructor used to say in high school, N as in no, no, Nanette, okay? Uh, my inscription cutter friend Eric pointed out that the letter N, rather than uh, a noticeable difference in the thick and thin of the uprights, stems on N, and the oblique, on the Generally, the thick and thin change based on a 30 degree cant angle of the writing tool, but on the N, they differ very slightly so that the N is almost even weight all the way through. And uh, he said, well, if I ever get around to doing this, I'm going to adjust that. I'm going to make the thins thinner than the oblique. Okay, his option. I wanted to stay true to the actual inscription. Okay. My choice, yes. Another question. Okay, hang on one second. Would you discuss the source of your slate and how it's prepared? Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, Kaddish was one of the original recyclers. Being a child of the Depression, 18 years old, he was released from high school, the orphanage, set out with a, uh, as I mentioned, a uh, apprenticeship with the sign painting folks in Chicago. Oh, you might have gotten a little, uh, what do they call it out west, uh, westerns, grub steak, you know. 
maybe maybe a saw buck or something. Here you go, kid. We got a place lined up for you. The union's going to take you and take care of you. You know. So uh, by the time I met him in 1967-68, when I was a baby stone cutter, he was a recycler, and he would call me up and say, "Paul, um, they're they're getting ready to tear down Lincoln School, a three-story bricks schoolhouse. They've got all slate chalkboards, so." We're going to go over there, bring your truck, we're going to go down there, and the pipe fitters and steel recyclers and every, all the pickup trucks would be there, okay? Day of the auction. It'd be hot, July, and said, they're going to start at the top of the building, so we're going to go up there and see how much they're getting for the slate chalkboards, and we're going to let them have it. We're going to take the ones on the second and third floor, we're going to take all of them. That way we don't have to carry them down as far and put them in your truck. I said, okay, Father, I'll bring my crowbar, okay? So we'd get them home. Um, we had polishing bricks, I call them, very fine grit, 440 and 600, and we polished the surface so that it gets nice and flat. I spent hours with water running across the surface, just polishing the surface of these stones, these slates, because a lot of them had been painted over the years and just painted black instead of poly If they had only known that all they had to do was polish them, it would have been a lot easier work for me as a kid, you know. So we'd polish them nice and smooth first, and then we'd do the layout, brush written, and then cut. And so the whole purpose of making sure that it's nice and smooth on the surface is that when you gild, where you saw that I uh, splashed over to the edge of the surface of it, nice and smooth, so then all you have to do is just polish it once again, get all the paint or gold or whatever it is on the outside of the surface, and all you're left with is the letter. So that's essentially the whole process. Then we seal it, make it waterproof. Waterproof, yeah. Good. But recycling, recycling, not letting anything go to waste, including rubber tires. We made fly swatters out of rubber tires. The inner tubes. Um, oh, okay. Here's another question. Okay. Do you know is the uh, plaster cast that was. Uh, that R.R. R. Donnelly had, is it still on display somewhere in Chicago? Or? I've heard that it is not. It was at their corporate headquarters on Wacker on the 36th floor. And if you intend to go there looking for it, best call ahead first to see if it is still there. It was the uh, first time I saw it, I can't remember the year, but it was one of their subsidiaries on... Uh, no, it was in North Chicago somewhere. It was a little ad agency. And so I looked them up, went up there, walked in the front door, and there it was, right on the wall. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I hope they know what this is, you know. But a number of years passed, and so when we went looking for it again, where I had my photo taken, it was in a computer lab on the 36th floor. Uh, you know, climate control conditions and all of that, which is what it needed, because he just, he painted the whole surface, and then he painted in the letters, you know. And I also read some correspondence when I was, um, oh, by the way, shameless plug. I wrote a biography of his life, just some, some things that I was able to put together by doing research here and there. And I just happened to have copies with me. But, um, and every penny goes to uh, support our nonprofit. But when I went in there, I saw that, uh, did the research, there was correspondence saying that there was going to be a big letter uh, exhibit in New York City. And they wanted this cast as the centerpiece. And there was argument going on with the Donnelly people because they didn't want it leaving Chicago at all. And then others said, well, you know, but this is so important. It's in New York City and blah, blah, blah. And so I think eventually it was moved for this exhibit. I haven't found the records on that yet. But um, by that time, uh, Kaddish had died, and they uh, had to insure it for something like $2 million just to transport back and forth. So they know what they have. So on the topic of the plaster cast, I have a little question. Did you explain, and I just missed it, um, what was wrong with the plaster cast that Gaudi was working from? In the V&A? Well, he was working from a photograph. Uh, we, we joked that, you know, for two pence and a bob, you could get your own photograph of the uh, plaster cast in London. And so 
I'd like to be able to scroll back to that, but I don't know what slide it is and so forth. But if you ever get a chance to see a photo of it, the M in the lower left-hand corner, it's, they just lined up a, a camera, took a photo, and in those days, the, the aberration on the edges tended to distort the letters. And so the M kind of, the, the one leg kind of kicks in a bit. And they were type, designing type based on that. Well, this is, this is the source, you know? And it was a plaster cast, which was an error to begin with, because it was painted in. Um, Kedish, Kedish actually respected Everett Johnson so much. In one of his correspondence, he says that had Johnson been available, or had he been involved with actual painting in the letters, it wouldn't have been as messed up as it is to this day. Because the cast is, is uh, it's in plaster, first of all. And if you know the properties of plaster, as it dries, it shrinks just a bit, just enough. And then it was done in sections, which were then stuck together at the museum. So in the text of his 1961 publication, he uh, actually draws out and points which letter in which line is distorted. And I can show you on this that bottom line, Monset Lock Constant, the S and T, that's one of the joins. And the left hand top, uh, well, the crossbar on the T, S T A N, Stan, the left hand side of that crossbar on the T is short, foreshortened so much it, it's, it looks wrong. It's just, and it's not a, uh, an exact copy of the Trajan. It's the way the plaster was formed and it was jammed together, basically. And he said, uh, he even says in the book that whoever painted it in, uh, again, the sign painter in Caddish coming out, said they, they dripped some paint on the surface and they didn't bother to clean it up. It's just whatever. But he points out letter, letter for letter the distortions and all the, the things that were wrong. And that's what really got him mad. Because it's like, oh my god, this is the Victorian Albert Museum. And this priest in America who went to high school in an orphanage, and then he went to some tiny little backwater college in Iowa, and I like to say Davenport, Idaho, see if anybody catches it. And then he went to State University for advanced degrees. What kind of pedigree is this? You know? Like we we went to Oxford and Cambridge. You know, we know what we're talking about. And here's this no-name priest that no one's ever heard of until he published his books. And now everybody says, yeah, these were written with a brush. And Father Caddy says so. And here's the read Origin of the Seraph. It should convince you. I can go on and on, believe me. Uh, Please. Okay, I have one more uh, very, probably very short answer question. And then if anybody else has a question, please raise your hand. Um, you, uh, speaking of Gaudi and that, uh, that book that Kaddish marked up, Yeah. where is that? St. Ambrose University oh. Archives. So we have to raid them. Is we, that just what we just had our hands on it. Oh. Take a workshop from us in Davenport, and we can get you in there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any last questions? Hmm. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming.